bara að segja allt sem ég vann, sem ég langa því að segja um mig, like úti stengavitt heiti ég og um, ég var fætt í Þýskalandi um, fyrir flýðingar og hérna svo tali ég ekki bara íslensku <laughs> en skipti til ennsku núna. Um, I'm going to tell you about the parasites in the body condition and the population change of the Icelandic rock ptarmigan today. Um, my, like, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Iceland and here at the Nautilfreis Dopnene. And uh, I'm guided through this process by Olafur Nielsen, who is here, and Kalli Skendesson, and who is also here, and Gunnar Stefansson. The, the ptarmigan in Iceland is a very common um, breeding, breeding bird and it's a very common game bird also, as you all know, and the favorite, favorite Christmas dish. And, um, and the ptarmigan population here in Iceland shows multi-annual cycles and that with peak numbers about every 10 years. And it is not really known what causes these cycles. So. Um, not, not only in Iceland, but um, in many parts of the world, it is not known. So um, I'm looking into one aspect of them, namely the parasite-host interactions, because they are such as suggested at one, as one of the driving forces, driving population cycles. Um, this project is, is embedded in a bigger project that was started by Olaf and Jürgen. Um, that is about the relationship between population change and the health-related parameters of the ptarmigan. And this project was started in 2006. And ever since, the parasites were also collected of the birds. So, in principle, I want to find out what is the relationship between the parasites and ptarmigan body condition and the population cycles here in Iceland. For this, we drove up north. This whole research is, um, takes place up in the north, in the north east of Iceland, in Mývartsveit. And the, um, the project is divided into two parts. Um, in, the, in the way, like the ptarmigan counts, they, they take place in the springtime. And like from 2006 to 13, I'm using this data. And we can gain the we gain the densities from from these the ptarmigan densities from these times and the but the parasites and the body condition we obtain at a different time of a year namely in the autumn in the october and we did so from 2006 to 2012 and uh, so far like in these years and the data that i'm using um we have obtained like 632 ptarmigan just for research. And um, yeah, and as I said, we obtained the, um, the parasite burden and the body condition from this data. The, the ptarmigan samples are divided like equally into different age and, and sex groups. Like it's about 50-50 males and females. And 60-40 as the ratio is um, juveniles, more juveniles than adults for every year. So what happens up north is um, that the ptarmigan are hunted. Here on the first picture, on the top left, we see Thorvald Sol Björnsson, one of our hunters, um, who's helping out with collecting the birds. Then the next step is um, how we, when the ptarmigan are hunted, how we start um, wrapping them up and writing down all necessary measurements of them, which is shown on the top right picture and on the bottom left picture. And um, until they are really readily packed, it takes a few minutes and then they are transported in the car, in a, like in a cooled condition to the laboratory. In the laboratory at Niva, this at Niva research station, which is the house on the on the top, 
um, a certain process is completed to obtain the parasites. And on the, we see here Olaf on, and Kalle, um, who, who Kalle is in this case vacuum cleaning the bird. This is how we obtain the ectoparasites, the parasites living outside on the bird. And in the further process, the bird is um, plucked, as we see on the um, upper, upper right. And we obtain also like samples or information from looking, by looking at the bird. You can see here on the left side is a, a clean and um, undiseased bird, a healthy bird. On the right side is a, a bird with scales with, um, that is diseased basically by a, probably a mite that lives in the skin. Then the process continues, and Kali is further watching a wing, for example, against a strong light source, um, where one can see easily also mite infections, um, or certain parasite infections of the bird. In the further process, the bird is then dissected, like taken apart. Everything is used from, from the bird, and not only the parasites, but I'm only talking about the parasites here. And the yeah, you know, and, and for this reason, like the the guts are taken out, which we see in the bottom left, from where the the endoparasites are gained, the parasites living inside the bird. Here is the main Leif Beinenda, main, the main mentor, Ole Nielsen, who just had his birthday, his 60th birthday. And on this occasion, we did a little movie, which basically shows um, what the procedure we do in the laboratory. So I would like to show you a little, a little of that.
auch. <laughs> so that was a little impression of the laboratory work. And yes, this is always exciting to find out something new about the ptarmigan. The, the process continues then coming from up north, up to the south, uh, down to the south, um, which is here at the Institute of Natural History and of, of, on Kelder, where I go through the parasite samples and um, collect the parasites. Um, in, the, in the laboratory, uh, I sit over the microscope and find very interesting parasites and um, inside and outside parasites. And sometimes this can be quite, quite surprising. And the, but then I say, okay, I, I will continue now and I need to analyze the data. And the data is analyzed in a, in a common program, which is R. Some people continue, uh, consider it like in the fire of the hell, but eventually it will turn out um, very nice to have some results. So here now the results. Um, this is the, Here's an example of, of some um, ecto- and endoparasites. On the, bot on the top, uh, ectoparasites shown, and on the bottom, the endoparasites. Thank you, Annette, for preparing this. Um, um, like, for example, are the most common mites, like five species of parasites um, are mites, like on the, on the top left. Then the time again has three species of lice, seen in the middle. Here, the example of Nagli, um, also flea, but they're very uncommon. And in the, in the bottom pictures, we see some of the endoparasites, some that um, live their entire life in the gut, like, for example, this protozoan Imeria in the beginning, but also like um, the, some bandworms occasionally and uh, nematodes, like in the middle. Here is some of the habitats of the parasite. They can be very different. Um, like on the left side, we see the, the parasites that live outside on the bird. So they occupy really very different niches. Like some live in the skin of the bird, and some live even in the, like here, in the feather shaft of the, of the bird. And it can be seen when, when the keratin layers are all, eat, are all eaten up then one knows that there's a parasite probably living in there, but also in the feather barks, like very small. That's what I said earlier, when one looks against a, against a strong light source, one can see like little spots. One cannot see clearly the whole parasite, but one sees in like an abundance of parasites. And the inside parasites are all from the gut, like some live in, in certain parts of the like, for example, the duodenum, others live exclusively in the cecum, like our appendix that is very big and or long in birds. And what I found so far is that, um, like, pretty much all, all the birds, all the ptarmigan carried in parasites in one way or the other, just one that did not, really. And the most common are the ectoparasites, they can be found in 98% of the birds, um, whereas the endoparasites um, occur in 85% of the birds. On the, on the bottom right picture, you see like um, the, the split between the whole complete parasite load, the ectoparasites, the parasites living inside the gut, and parasite richness, which is the number of parasites, number of species. And in basically all, almost all cases, we see that juveniles in the black line and adults in the gray line, that more juveniles carry more parasites. This is very like uh, clear in when looking at all the parasites, but when then splitting up actual endoparasites, it's not that clear anymore. Like endoparasites occur really in, in both in in juveniles and adults in similar amount. So, 
looking into further detail. Here are, you see all the parasites um, written out in a way. On the top is the, are the endoparasites. In the second row are the mice. And in the, on the bottom here, these are lice. This is the hippoboscid fly. And this is the flea species. Again, it's divided between black line juveniles and um, gray line adult birds and the timeline you see on the bottom. So it's a, a very, very strong difference. It's like certain parasites are very prevalent. So this is about on how many birds are infected in a population. So Ameria, for example, as you say, as you see in the in the top left is a very common parasite, endoparasite, uh, similar to Tetraolichus just below, as the mite species occurring in the wings, like in the under, underwing cover, for example. Um, whereas other species, like again, the flea, or um, <coughs> like Nialgis, um, are very, not that prevalent in the birds, not that common. What I want to point out here is also the, the swing, like you see particularly in, in the Ameria species, that it goes down, like from the, it first decreases and then increases again up to 2011, then to decrease again. I'm pointing this out because it will later show some, some indication, a possible relation with the population density of the ptarmigan. On the next picture on the next slide here um, is very similar, like the order is the same, but this is not about the prevalence, about the proportion of birds infected in the population, but about the intensity, like how, how much parasites really occur in the, on the birds, like in, in which intensity they are there. And the, um, here we see there is not, there is a difference in juveniles and females in juveniles and adults, but um, that is really not that strong when, when it's about the intensity. It just um, peaks at different times, like here in Nymeria species, or, or here. Whereas, um, I want to point out the um, certain peaks that occur in 2000, for example, at Nivea in, in 2011. Also in Ameria Rupa up there, um, that basically fall il along with the with the following crash, like in Tarmic in numbers possibly. The next slide again, same um, same order is about the aggregation of the parasites in the population. The aggregation says something or suggested to play a big role in the uh, in, in driving a population. It's like parasites are very evenly distributed throughout the whole population, or if they occur like in clumps, which is very typical in, in parasites that the distributions are very clumped, like in a way aggregated. And when when they show lower aggregation, like here, or again, like a little swing in Ameria, then they are supposed to have a, a, a main effect, which was shown before by a model that is called the Anderson and May model. The test suggested certain factors in the, in, the, in the parasites that might be the reason why it can cause population cycles. Here now the interaction um, of you see in the in the black straight line the the population density in the dotted line black dotted line you can see the body condition index of the bird like how how well how healthy is the bird and in the colored line on the top and here um, are the Ameria species for both like this. Uh, example is for a juvenile bird, and this is for an adult bird. And um, again, you have the timeline on the bottom. 
and it's uh, pretty much like just taking out this one parasite, like the, the Ameria species, and, and shows, makes something to, to the eye, it shows some kind of relation, and I don't know, I cannot read up there, but um, assuming, I will use the picture here, that the dotted line is the body condition index, and that was, that was really collected in October, I'm going to uh, use the peak to illustrate it best. Um, this data was collected in October. Then the peak that we see here in the straight black line in, in first the population density the next spring. So really these, these two points are really close. One can basically say that the population density reflects what happens with the body condition of the birds. And then um, we see the time lag for the, for the parasite, and both in, in juvenile and in adults. And the time lag, counting, counting back, taking this example, one, and then going to spring, one and a half years, really. So um, this is what I see, what the result is from the parasite data, and the I'm sorry, this is uh, the same species here, Ameria. It's not Goniotis. Um, uh, that, that there's possibly some relation. And what I did upon this to find out, because it's difficult to do statistics like with such a short, short time period, is I shifted the, the density measure, like this tra trajectory here. I shifted forth and back in time, like one and two years. And then Really, when, when shifting it like here, as you can probably imagine, then it is uh, really pretty much overlapping with the parasites all of a sudden. And now the other way around, I shifted it like this way, both ways anyway. But uh, so then it was really overlapping with the with the body condition. But then the it was exactly the opposite with the with the with the parasite, and that gave me a negative, significant relationship or correlation, basically, which kind of proves proves the correlation between the an associ association between the parasite and the population condition density and the body condition of the of the parasites of the time again. But um, yeah, and this is what I find so far. And this I found not only for the Imeria, although the strongest relationship is with the smallest, with this intestinal parasite, this Imeria, but also, um, which is not the case here, but the, this Laos gonoides lagopi, it also showed a stronger relationship, negative, and um, one mite species. But this mite species, what I found was the exact opposite. It was like um, all the time positively correlated with, with body condition and with um, population density, which is kind of interesting because I would assume that the parasite has an, a negative effect on, on the body condition of the bird or um, in this case, but obviously it was kind of positively related to it and which means that it did not harm necessarily the bird, but more went with it. Maybe it had even some contributing character, like for example, was shown that some some parasites actually contribute by cleaning, like a mite by feeding on the on the leftovers in the feathers, cleaning off the feathers so that the bird can bird can preen itself again and put on new wax, for example. Yeah. So to conclude, um, to yeah, these results is that uh, um, the juveniles they carried more overall more parasites than the adults as shown before mm. and it is really that it was suggested or it is clear it was shown before that it's the juveniles that really drive the population change so i was very interested in looking at this difference between juvenile and adult birds um, and the body condition of both of juveniles and adult birds changed in accordance with the population density, and it was, um, as I said, highest 
just before the peak in the, in the population density. And then um, the parasites preceded, uh, I mean the density and body condition trajectories, the lines preceded the um, parasites, especially those of, of the coccidians, this Imeria, this Imeria species, and the, the Laos gonoides of one and a half years. And was when I shifted them one year in time, the correlation was significant. Now, so what I assume, what I can generally assume, but carefully assume from this is uh, that parasites probably do exhibit some destabilizing qualities, both directly weakening the bird, causing mortality, possibly due to disease, but also indirectly by um, weakening the bird and making them probably or changing the behavior of the bird by making them making them more prone to predation, for example, like and it has been shown very often that um, that the bird uh, lose their sense their sense of how fast they fly, where they fly, and that they're not so careful for the predators anymore. Uh, yeah. But it, from this research, it's, it becomes also clear that it's because the, overall the, the ptarmigan carries really few parasites compared to other countries. Like we are not talking about like thousands and thousands when talking about intensities, but it's really like the highest intensities, for example, for certain worms we found is like 100 or, and, and no more. And like, so the, um, it's really not that strong of an influence that I would expect, um, but more really like a, a contributing, um, a contributing situation to it, and that um, like the factor like predation that was that Olaf and Nielsen was looking at before, that this is probably stronger, but that the um, pathogens like parasites may contribute some, and even some other factors contributing to it, like a diet. Um, and what the bird eats, um, it, like it's a very complicated picture. And just looking at the parasites, I can say, okay, there is some relation to it, but um, I, I cannot ex exclusively say that this is just the parasites that are causing the cycle or something like this. Um, so I try to um, do what I can here to find out um, what the parasites do. And then later on, maybe possibly for future research, to combine um, the different factors and different like predation and pathogens and diet and different aspects of the ptarmigan ecology and biology and the parasite biology too. So that's what's hopefully following next. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions and suggestions. <laughs> Fyrir út þeim. Uh, gefið mér endilega merki. Ég gerir á fyrir að einhver vil ég bera fram spurningu. Eða ég kem með hljóðnemann til ykkar. Sturla spyr hérna, spyr hérna uh, hvort að uh, að rjúbundar uh, uh, ég þetta ekki lýs af hvort annan við tóm þeim pick out uh, the lies from each other, do, like, a, like a person would do. <laughs> I've not seen that before, but uh, why not? I mean, when, when the family groups are together, like the female, when it raises the offspring, um, and they are in a very tight group, why not? It's, it's improbable. I've never seen it personally, but uh, no. <laughs> Já, Kristin Haukur, takk fyrir fyrirlestur nú til. Ég kannski spyr á ennsku. Já, takk. Það hérna, uh, við erum að gleyma spurningunni, við sjá. Uh, yes, I was wondering if there was any uh, competition between the individual parasite species for space on the tarmica, or they, do they all have a certain niche? So. Já, takk fyrir þetta. 
you know, that's, uh, um, they do, ha each parasite has a certain niche, so what we find so far, otherwise they would not survive on the bird, probably, but, and um, that's in, it's one of my thoughts, and one um, article that will come along also, there is, do, there is co-occurrences and co-variation within the parasites, probably it could, could be seen like on, on the figure before, you know, like certain parasites will cancel each other out, and some um, will kind of go along, go together, have similar, like the biology, like a biological threats, um, yeah, and will occur together. There's definitely some co-variation amongst them, what I, what I see here. Já, eina Þalleyrsson, ég ætla að spyrja hann út og út í hérna um, sko, stofsefnin í rjúpinni hvort að aukist þessa sýkingar í einstaklingum eða eða yfir stofnin um, if I put it in English og þetta uh, when, when a term again is peaking svona around about every 10 years um, are there more par parasites in individual termicans or in the population all over do, do you have a clue? Um, there will, there's definitely more more parasites in an individual bird. Like this is what the what makes the term, the parasite distribution in the population so, so special. That's what I mean by what I meant by aggregation of parasites. It's usually that um, single birds here and there are like will be very heavily infected or infested with parasites. But overall, like um, the, the infection is low in the population. Otherwise, the, the parasite would kind of kill itself. If, like, all birds were heavily infected or infested, then it's kind of a suicide of the parasites, really. Like, so the, the um, yeah, it is like this, that single birds are most heavily par parasitized or more heavily par parasitized than, um, than the whole population. Yes. Does this answer your question? <laughs> My name is Esther, thank you, Ute. I was wondering if uh, you have any uh, comparative area to compare with this uh, results because uh, I guess this is a high density area for ptarmigans and it looks like a very heavy parasite load up to 100%. Do you have any ideas of other areas if they have uh, less parasite load? In Iceland, yeah. in Iceland, not yet, not yet. There has been a, a study on the on a one-year study to show um, the how many parasites occur on the bird with throughout the months, and that's like also done by Kalle and Ole. And um, this is known, but otherwise here in Iceland, I'm not aware of one on ptarmigan. <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, you, you were talking about the, the parasite inside the gut of the ptarmigan. Um, would that uh, be uh, dangerous for human beings to uh, um, to um, eat uh, such uh, termicans and um, uh, I'm thinking of that uh, it would be uh, unhealthy for Icelanders to uh, uh, to eat uh, termicans at Christmas and uh, we would rather have to uh, import grasshoppers from uh, Australia <laughs> instead we were the mother of the that would be a crunchy snack, though. <laughs> have, have some grasshoppers from, yeah. Are they not passengers? No. Grasshoppers? They can what be quite... Um, the, the grasshoppers? No, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, like the parasites here in Tarmigan, as I said, are very few. And they, those that occur, that really occur in, in closed systems, like in the intestines that we don't eat, 
or like the bottom and the top layer of this of the skin or in the feathers and we don't eat the feathers we pluck the birds inside them no and the, the the ones inside are in the guts and we don't eat the guts really like like the rest there is none we ha we can eat the liver and and there's no parasites there or we at least didn't find them so far and we are not dead yet <laughs> Flurry, yeah. There was bit, bit of, there was one parasite that was in the connective tissue in between, but that was an, like an accidental parasite that happened like I think two years ago. Kali found it in Bali, and the, it doesn't really occur in time again. So this, the the probability that that one gets in gets such a bird is very very low. Well, uh, my name is Alfred Dilson, a retired physician. Uh, I remember some uh, 65 years ago, I, I attended a lecture by Finn Gunnison on particularly this subject of 10 years cycle, life cycles. And uh, as I understand today that we are no further on than 65 years ago, uh, solving the mystery. Yes. But I was wondering about the parasites themselves. They do have a tenure circle. Are they dependent on, on the tamagun, or is the tamagun dependent on the parasite? Mm -hmm. Could the parasite be regulating the hormonal balance or growth factors in the tamagun? Uh, uh, are there any? Uh, is it possible to look at it differently and look at the life cycles of the of the parasites rather than the tamagun itself? Yes, yes, that's a good point. Thank you for that. Um, Yes, it is, and it's uh, definitely like overall a, a like very finely adapted system over thousands and millions of years that the the bird and the parasite have adapted with each other to to cause this. And I'm definitely looking like on the side also on the biology of the parasite, what their cycle is like. Yes, but it's um, like much shorter. Like it's a it's place all like within a in a very a short time frame what I'm looking at. Like I have not um, approached really the parasite itself and looked at um, how they behave over, um, but it's, um, it's imaginable that they are, that this is the other way around, that they, yeah. Um, then they recently described the genome of man was got uh, uh, ten times more uh, parasites or, or, or bacteria than the cells of the body. So the, the, the human being is regarded as a genome of uh, a lot of species, yeah. uh, hundreds of species uh, uh, who carry a much greater uh, uh, DNA mass than, 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 uh, than the man itself. So uh, if, if you look at it in that connection, that uh, the parasite is a collection of parasites and, and the body fluids and body cells of the tamagun itself. So would it be helpful to look at the other things, other DNAs than the, than the DNAs of the, of the tamagun? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is definitely an option to look at the DNA. We have not done so yet. Like this, this study on parasites has basically just started off. Like we recently found the, the species that occur, and that's the first more detailed study, and they have only scratched the first surface really with it. Hi, my name Hi. is Jon. Was there any correlation in the individual birds between the parasite load and the body condition? Did you see an effect that a heavily infested bird was also sick or with Nothing like that. It's really a purely correlative study. I mean, we basically shot the bird, and I no, didn't look at them. Like what happened? Like if you, they, do you mean do they look? No, they look because you're doing these uh, health or overall body condition measurements. Yeah. Did they correlate that a bird with a high high infestation was also of a poor condition, body condition? Yeah, yeah. I thought that's what I. What I intended to show, like I showed the body condition and the um, the the birds that were had a good body condition had few parasites. Yeah, okay. Like for for this example here. But that was on a kind of a, uh, on, a on a large scale, but on, on the individual bird, I'm, I was meaning. On the individual bird. Mm. 
Ah, oh, entonces matas. It's like um, no, I didn't look at the individual bird in this case. But okay. No. But but uh, you, I understood you correctly also that the because over, overall the parasite load in, in, in the Icelandic birds is quite low compared to some other yes. countries or yes, for example to Scotland. Yeah. It was I'm just giving an example out of the loo. The, there's this Trichostrongulus tinnus, it's like a worm-like species living in the guts. Yeah. And the loon, this species, it occurs like there's thousands of them in the guts. And that really weakens the bird. And when, when they were given vaccines, the birds, parasitized, par parasitized with these, then they, they, the population cycle leveled out. So this is how strong the impact can actually be just of one species. But as I said, this was like a thousands and thousands of parasites living in the guts. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you, uh, last question, do you have any, actually from a friend here, do you have any indication that external factors like the weather or, or the condition has any impact on the parasites? I mean, do they? The weather? Yeah. No, not yet. I, looked, I didn't look at that yet because I'm so focused on the parasites that I... <laughs> no, I mean, if, if, if it's extremely cold, then these exoparasites, they will, they will die, or, or vice versa, if they will thrive in dry conditions, if they will thrive in wet conditions. Yeah, yeah they, like some, definitely some of the parasites that need wetter conditions, and they will definitely occur closer to the ocean, for example, than farther inland. Okay. And like, giving this example again of this, of this little parasite that I was just talking about, the worm, just to give one example, um, that one needs the moisture on the plant to crawl up in the drop to the top of the plant so that the bird will eat the, this plant, actually. So that's just one example, yeah? And, um, but otherwise, the, the parasites that occur up here in, in Iceland, like it's so, Iceland is so geographically isolated and the climate has been rough all the time. So the parasites that live here on the bird, they have um, probably, and that need to go through the outer cycle, they are definitely very well adapted to the to the climatic conditions that are here in the far north. Yeah. Yeah, but there is less snow and more wet. It seems yes. in the last decade, so I just that that, Yeah, that would be interesting to see what effect this has in terms of climate change. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, my name is Oliver, and thank you, Ute. Uh, I was uh, not going to come with a question, but just one comment that relates to the question by Jon just before, uh, relating to uh, the individual birds and parasite burden, and the statistical test, if I remember correctly, they showed a clear relationship for some of the species. So if you had certain species of parasites, then you were both smaller and in worse condition than birds that had fewer or none of those. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so I'll tell you, but I'll be for my lot of the logic. Look, and if you're good.